Do you ever like uh, kind of scout locations yourself before you, you commit them to page and do that kind of research? Yes, I like to do that um, when I can. I mean, certainly in, in doing a true story, you definitely want to do that because you'll, you'll see a detail and that'll spark it. One of the most amazing things with, with At Close Range was we went and we saw the, the Sean Penn's mother and grandmother, where, they, where the real characters lived. And I described those rooms with just one or two small details. And when they made the movie and I walked onto the set for those rooms, they were almost exactly like what I'd seen. And all I'd given them, I'd just given the, the one distilled clue and the, the art director had gone from there and recreated what I'd seen. And I, you know, it still gives me chills to think of it. It's like some Jungian collective consciousness yes, experience. exactly. That's exactly right. Well, since we're at, at close range, um, let's discuss the scene that sure. uh, you talked about a, a particular importance to you. And I think um, it, it would be a, a scene anyone would bring up uh, in terms of its, its power. The whole movie's powerful, but the whole movie kind of builds to this final confrontation between Sean Penn's character, Brad Jr., and his, and his father. Right. Incredibly well played by both, but, but incredibly memorably played by Christopher Walken. It, the reason I picked that scene uh, is because I think, it's a, I think it's not entirely successful. I think it's a good scene. I think it's an interesting scene. It's got a lot of power to it. But when I watch it, I go, well, Maybe this could be better, maybe that could be better. Oh, that's interesting. And it's not taken from real life. In real life, uh, the character played by Walken, um, the real person, uh, well, he didn't shoot, but his brothers shot these, the boy and the girl. The girl was hit once and killed. The boy was hit eight or 10 times and lived. Well, you're hit eight or 10 times, you're not gonna walk clean yourself up and go over to dad's house, you're gonna to go to the hospital. And the original draft of the script had that in it. And um, at one, for a while, Bob Rafelson was attached. And he said, we have to have a scene where the, the boy goes and confronts his father after this. So I wrote the scene and sent it to Bob and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And we ended up with this version of the scene, which, you know, which is a pretty good scene. And the first time I, I I had to speak with um, uh, Joan Tewksbury, and you know, she, so she showed a scene from Nashville, and I showed this scene, and I showed it for the same reason because I wasn't entirely happy with the scene, and I wanted to see it. And actually, I thought, well, the scene's pretty good, but um, and I can't exactly tell you what I feel is wrong with it. Could it be that you have what we don't have, which is your original version of it in your head? Exactly. I think that's part of it, and I think it's definitely part of it. So I think we all enjoy it because it's, it's incredibly well written, but it's also you know, two actors that people just love to see. Yes, exactly. Go at it. Exactly. And they were together in the same exactly. kind of frame so of film. Yeah, so I think that Bob's instinct was correct. But if, for me, uh, I, yes, I, I guess I have this small, still voice saying, it didn't really happen that way. And everything else in the movie pretty much happened as the, the way I wrote it. So, I mean, you know, there are, there are scenes that I created, but the, the really significant events are all from real life. And so I felt that that scene was made up in some way that I didn't like, although there are moments in it that feel, that feel very authentic to me. Right. You know, so like when he starts talking about the family gun, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that feels like something that the real kid would say and, and that, you know, that worked when Sean said it. Um, and the wince that Walken gives, I think the one point when the gun's pointed at him, and he just, he gives that, doesn't he do like a, hey, hey? <laughs> yes, you know, um, uh, Walken was very nervous about the scene. And he, um, he went over with the prop guy, you know, this is a gun, and it's just, <laughs> it's not a real gun, blah, 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 blah. And Sean knew that Walken was nervous and knew that he had checked on the gun. And Sean brought a different gun there. So when Walken saw the gun, he knew it wasn't the gun that he had checked out. And he didn't completely trust Sean. I mean, Walken's a wild character. 
Um, what, so, what, what, so when the gun was pointed at him, he was, he's going like, wait a minute, maybe that's a real gun. Oh, so that's real moments of anxiety we're seeing on screen. Absolutely, yeah. You know, there was something, you, I don't know if you know this about Walken, but he, when he breaks down a script, he, he breaks it down so that um, he puts stops arbitrarily after various words. So if the, if the line says, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to know her in Omaha, she was a cute girl. Uh, he would put a stop after she. So he would read it as, I used to know her in Omaha, she was a cute girl. And now it's become fodder for impressions of Chris Walken. Exactly. <laughs> well, when I, he was doing At Close Range, it seemed like every take, he would put his stop in a different place and his affect would change. And he would come to the set and he'd go, what was this scene about? Here today. He said, well, you take your stepson out in the woods to shoot him. And he go, oh, do I shoot him? You know, he's like, wonder, yeah, you shoot him. You wonder if he's even read the script. And one day he came to me and he said, you know, and I'm going through this, watching his performance. And not, one day he comes to me and he says, you know, this speech here, what's this about? And it was the speech about that he says to, to his stepson before he shoots him. And it's about, about, the, about the dogs? About the coyotes and the, coyotes. the dogs, yeah. And it was something that I knew by feel belonged in the movie when I wrote it. But it was the one thing in the script that I couldn't explain. So he comes to me and he <laughs> says, what's this, what's this speech about anyway? And I said, I, I have to tell you, Chris, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know it's right. I know your character says it. I know it's real, but I can't tell you exactly what it means. He says, I'll tell you what I think it means. And he goes into this very eloquent riff explaining the speech. And I go, yeah, I, I think you're right. That is what it means. So he was kind of testing the boundaries of I don't think he was testing. Uh, I think he wanted to see maybe to see if I had a different explanation or maybe it just came to him. I don't know. He exists in some weird ether. Right. It's different from, from everyone else. But it's interesting because it's in both cases with Sean bringing the real, a different gun and Walken kind of having his own reasoning behind that speech. You, you, you had two actors that kind of brought their own process to the screenplay, which yeah. must always be a good thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, not always a good thing, but a good thing in that, <laughs> in that case. Yeah. That scene started from a more logical, reality-based place in terms of the son confronting the father after, the, after a hospital stay, and it kind of evolved into more of a... No, 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 it didn't. But it never happened in real life, no, period. No, it never happened in real mm -hmm. life, period. In real life, he just went and, you know, he went and he talked to the authorities because, you know, his girlfriend had been killed, and he testified against his dad, and, you know. What do you think of the, kind of the, the shots of, of Sean's character washing the the blood off the bullet wounds and seeing the bullets embedded in his skin. Because I remember when I saw it, it made a real, I, it was, I, I loved it because it, it made a real impression on me. It's like, God, that must hurt. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, though, to me, though, it's funny, so you love that. Because to me, those shots are, 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 are practically the only thing in the movie that really bothers me. Because they're because, all music video fetishes. They're music, yeah, it feels unreal to me. It feels like, I can, I can almost buy him just going, you know, crawling to the car, getting into the car, driving to his dad's place, pulling himself together enough to walk in. But the cleaning up felt to me like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm, I'm bleeding. We did have him shot a lot, so he's gonna be bleeding from a lot of different places now. I understand he doesn't want his father to see the blood. All that makes sense, but I agree with you, but it got me. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just on a visceral level. But you, did, you know, it's funny. You, you, as a writer, you don't know what's going to work. There was one scene that, um, there's one shot where the camera swoops down onto Walken's face. And I said to, to the director, we, you know, we, we're, as, us, as usually happens, you were, you're always worried about budget. You're always having to cut stuff. And I said to the director, you know, we don't really need this scene. We already know what the scene says. And he said, I have a great way to shoot it. It's really going to work. 
So I said, okay, you know, thinking he was making a mistake. And then he shot it and it really works. It's very powerful. And it's kind of instructive because as a, a you know, screenplays seem to be so much about structure and about information and about building, and they are. And yet, it, there are, there's the poetry of certain moments, there's the visceral feel of certain moments that works even if you already have the information. I mean, another example is in um, Reversal of Fortune, the, you know, the most famous lines in the movie, the lines that people quoted all the time were, you're a very strange man, you have no idea. When we, when we were looking at the script, I said to Barbet, you know, you don't need these lines. We already know that he's a very strange man. We already know Dershowitz thinks that. And we already know that Klaus is weird, so we don't need the lines. And Barbet, to his everlasting credit, said, I have a really good way to shoot this. I think it's going to work. So I said, fine. But, you know, if you, as a, as a writer, you're taught to try to cut what isn't absolutely necessary. And yet, you have to leave in the juice. Because if you just cut to the bone, all you have is bone, and you don't have no flesh. And then there'd be no Lion King homage to those lines. Yes, exactly. Had they not been in the original film? <laughs> no, I know. Would, did that kind of tip your fancy that it made yeah. it into the lexicon like that? Yeah, that was funny. And, the, and the, the guys who wrote that movie came up to me and said, I hope it's OK. You don't mind. Uh, in terms of uh, that final confrontation in At Close Range, did you revise the dialogue a lot? Did it go through a lot of revisions, or did you pretty much nail it? On the first draft? I think I pretty much nailed it. Not on the first draft. I mean, I, as I said, I went back and forth with Rafelson, but I, I think it was pretty much. Uh, I don't think we worked on it a lot. You know, there, there, there wasn't. There, in shooting, there, was, there were almost no changes. So a after um, Sean Penn takes a shot at him and he asks, What's eating you? Was that like a conscious, it must a conscious attempt to inject humor? Well, into the scene, or is it the way walking and you decided it should be done with the director? Well, I, I'm a great believer in humor. And, I'm a, and I think that, you know, in a certain sense, life is always a comedy. Um, and particularly humor in, in dark moments and scary moments right from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, so I think that, you know, it's... And people are often scared of it. When my scripts are read at the cast reading, people always say, oh my God, I don't realize it was so funny. At Close Range was an example. The people were laughing all the way through, so much so that they were worried that the would play like a comedy. Well, it doesn't entirely play like a comedy, but when you're able to go to a line that has humor in it, you're, you're going to the edge. As long as you don't go over the edge, you're fine. Does, so, it help, does it help you, does something like that help you extend the tension? Yeah, 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 because it, it releases tension in a peculiar way, but, you know, so that you can build it up again. And it doesn't release it all, it doesn't, if it's the wrong line, it'll totally deflate it. But if it's a good line, it'll, it'll, it'll allow you, a, give you a little bit of a laugh. The same way, um, you know, Lily Tomlin, was, you know, when you would look back at her old TV shows, she would break your heart and then make you laugh, and make you laugh and then break your heart. And because she made you laugh, she'd break your heart more. And because your heart was broken, you could laugh more. And Richard Pryor would do the same thing. You know, it's like there are ways that when you blend different forms, different emotions, and so forth, you can, I think you can achieve something grander. Yeah, that scene is wonderfully tense, and you, you, you extend it just enough where it doesn't break, but it, it's... Did you just know how to, per, how to pace that right you know, off the bat? You know, there may have been terrible lines that are cut, Mike. I don't know. <laughs> right. No, you try, yeah, you, try to, you try to go as far as you... I mean, in my mind, you go as far as you can with the script. You push things as far as you can. Including, the, did you have the staging down in, in the script in terms of the, yeah. the kitchen and where it was going to be, where they were yeah. going to be standing? Well, not probably where mm -hmm. they were standing, but right. yeah. The, um, you know... When I write a script, you, I've, I've returned in a script and people say, I hate it. The executive says, I hate it. So I said, go in and meet and say, what do you hate? Well, this line, the person is just, you know, that's going to get a laugh. This is too extreme. You can't say that. You can't do that. Well, it turns out there are five or six lines. And you take those five or six lines out and there's no problem. I always believe it's worth pushing for those. Maybe there were 12 lines in that screenplay that were on the edge of being extreme. Six of them went too far. I take those six lines out. You find out where the boundaries are, 
But when you can push things, that's when you're really alive. Once the actors came on board, especially actors like Walken and Penn, did you, did you have to do much rewriting for them? or Not really. The only rewriting I did was to trim the budget. Um, you know, we were always having to cut and cut and cut, and that was really unfortunate. And the sad thing is, for this movie, is my favorite scene never got shot. Oh, which, what was that? It was a scene where the father, the boy meets his, the girl he's in love with, and then he goes to stay with his dad, and his dad says, come on, come with me, let's go somewhere, I want you to meet some folks. And he takes his son to a whorehouse. And all the whores start fussing over, obviously the father's a regular. All the whores start fussing over the son and making obscene jokes with him and flirting with him. And, you know, and then the second part of the scene, the two guys are in the same room with their whores. And the father is quizzing his son's whore on how the boy is doing. Wow. And it was a scene that um, Anthea Silbert, who was the executive on the movie at United Artists prodded me to write. I mean, she didn't say, well, what about a scene of Whorehouse? She said, I think you need one more scene with the father and son. And it gave the movie a kind of early liftoff uh, in terms of, whoa, this movie's going somewhere really wild and different. And um, because of various political reasons I won't go into, we didn't get to shoot the scene. But I always felt that that scene would have made the movie really take off. Was it based on uh, articles from the Philadelphia yeah, Inquirer? Yeah, there were articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, and you know, the, you know, there was a real gang, was a real kitty gang, it was, you know, it was all real. So you, you didn't um, change much for dramatic effect, or? Well, I, I, there, there, were, there were, I mean, I, know, I knew that the father took the boy's girl um, off and they raped her. So I knew that, but I had to write the scene in the, you know, so right. like I'm re you're writing the scenes, I have no information. There were like five real lines of dialogue, I think, in the movie, or in the script anyway. Um, but other than that, it was, you know, I, was make, I made it up, but the, the, I mean, the father was a completely insane character. He was sent, obviously went away, he was convicted and was sent to prison, he was sent to an all-black prison. He was one of a handful of white inmates in this prison. Maybe there were six, a dozen. He started a Ku Klux Klan unit in the prison. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy, even for yeah. prison. Even for prison, that guy's out of his mind. Um, it's wild. Yeah. You can only get Chris Walken to play that guy. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> Have you ever had a, an example of a roadblock when you were writing a script, something you had to kind of plow through, either in Reversal of Fortune or Enough, or any of your produced screenplays where you just, you know, hit a snag and had to power through it? I almost always hit some point where I feel like, oh my God, it's over. I'm gonna have to give the money back. This isn't gonna work. And, you know, I'm tr as for ex specific examples, the, the worst, you know, I wrote a script about a, um, about a, a girl who, was, who I believed when I started to write the script was falsely accused and imprisoned for murder. And I researched it for three months and I was a month into writing the script when suddenly I woke up one day and I knew she was guilty. That sounds like a chilling moment. And that was really a horrible, chilling moment. And I had to say, well, because the whole end of the movie was based on the feeling that she was innocent. So I had to completely revise my, I mean, I figured out a way to do it, but the script was never as good as it was going to be if, if the audience felt, if I believed she was innocent, and the audience would feel she was innocent. And so, you know, that's one of the worst examples. But, you know, frequently I've, uh, I will work for a month on something and then realize I can't write it. Or I'll work for, for a month on something and realize it doesn't have enough juice. You know, it's not exciting enough. I've already written it in my head, so why write it? 
You know, I mean, because as I say, I'm chasing something which is new and different and which can, or, or has some psychological element for me that, that makes it exciting. Do you find yourself drawing from real life or personal experience, even on the true stories you've adapted? Well, you, you're always drawing from, from your own experience. It's hard to say why but, or how, but I always feel when I write something that the, whatever I write is like a snapshot of me, a snapshot of my character. And if you fractured my character into the 15 different people who are in the movie, or the five or six principal people who are in the movie, that would give some view of who I am at that moment. So, you know, to take this at close range, I'm this innocent boy, I'm this horrible father, mm. I'm this innocent girl who's falling in love, I'm all these, the father's brothers who are, have this fantastic camaraderie and are a family. I, I'm these, I'm this sad, these sad women who are servile to these men. I'm all these different people. And, you know, so uh, it's, it's sort of like being schizophrenic, only more than schizophrenic. Right. We've got a little screenwriting exercise uh, set up for you. We call it the object. Frederick, the tray, please. Frederick here uh, is going to reveal an object on this tray to you. It's uh, chosen at random, unknown to all. Uh, your job is to make up a story about it and then tell me the story and then tell me why you made up that particular story. Show them the object. Your object, sir. First of all, I have to tell you that when I was in um, therapy, I didn't remember my dreams. And my therapist would say, you, you never remember your dreams? I said, no, basically don't remember them. And I, then I would say, but I can have a dream for you if you want. And I would close my eyes and I would have, have a dream. So the only way that I can do this is by closing my eyes. Do it, no and, rules. Okay, good. I see a woman with a cigarette holder. She's dressed in black. Her hair is red. She has a, an enormous secret. There's a man in the other room who is in love with her and has to kill her. The object um, was brought from the Far East by her mother. Her mother um, actually adopted her, but um, never told her that she was adopted. She lights her cigarette, and then she turns toward the door and asked the man in the other room, who's dressed a lot like Frederick, was that his name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who's dressed a lot like Frederick, to come in. He enters, and she pushes her lit cigarette through his neck, the cigarette holder, and out the other side. And now we cut to the, his behind him, and we see running down his neck and over the back of his beautiful suit, blue blood. And we don't know whether it's just that his blood is blue or he's some alien of some kind. And he falls to the floor 
and the blue becomes water. And then she takes out another cigarette and lights it and walks out of the room. That woman's got a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I imagine she uses that lighter to light yeah, the cigarettes. Yeah, she uses these, yeah, that's, yeah. Now how did you, what, was it just spontaneous what popped into your head? Or? Yeah. That certainly was a catastrophic imagination. Yeah, that was a catastrophic imagination. And um, yeah, as per what I said before. And you know, that is sort of, I mean, that's like writing. Right. Me. You brought a lot of mystery to the object too, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Well. I thought he literally was a blue blood. He was a blue blood. <laughs> there you go. That's right. He was a blue blood. So is that, do you approach your own kind of process with that kind of spontaneity? Well, I, well as I say, I try to. Because I think that the more you can keep things spontaneous. I mean, the greatest fun for me is when I can write something quickly without having too much preparation and it works. When, when all the muscles that I've developed over the years as a screenwriter in terms of structure fall into place so that I can layer, but it's like that, that structural voice co comes in and says, now you have to introduce another character. And another character walks in and does that, but I can have, you know, what I'll call the lighter visions um, uh, occur. As much as as much as they can, so the, the so the screenplay writes itself in a short period of time. Now it doesn't often happen, and sometimes when it happens, you end up with a problem that you have to solve over the next four years, you know, or whatever. 